September 11th, a time for Americans to pause and remember the thousands killed in the terrorist attacks in 2001 and those who gave their all to save others that day. 9-11 never left him. 9-11 became him. Uh, he would do it all over again. Some of America's last troops in Afghanistan returning home and the impact of two decades of war on everyday life. On this special edition of The Inside Story, 9-11, 20 years later. Hi, I'm Carla Babb, VOA's Pentagon correspondent. We're standing steps away from where American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon on 9-11 at 9.37 a.m., killing 184 people. Nearly 3,000 died in terrorist attacks that day. Another plane headed for the Capitol crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Two planes hit the World Trade Towers in New York City. The crumbled twin towers became known as ground zero of the terrorist attack changing the lives of thousands of people. Many Americans old enough to remember the attacks know exactly where they were that day. I was in high school in North Carolina. I remember how the faculty turned on the TVs to follow what was happening. I remember the disbelief, the sadness in the hallways. I also remember the bravery we saw, how people gave their lives to save the lives of others. Here's VOA's Anna Rice with more on the heroism from that day. It was uh, a terrible sight to see. He was all full of the white powder. 147 is his firehouse, which is what he loved. That's where his heart always was. Inside his helmet, he kept pictures of us. This was actually the last picture I took with my dad. This picture, snapped by an unknown photographer, went viral in both the U.S. and international media. A copy of the photograph is stored at the National September 11th Memorial and Museum. This is our father here kneeling down. Um, you know, he was working down at the pile for months. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks, Eliotto worked for extended periods of time at Ground Zero, looking for the remains of the dead breathing in toxic substances that took a toll on his health. And my husband had glass and uh, pieces of black smoke and uh, things in his, in his lungs. And little by little, he was t taken from us. Doctors said he had 10 years at most. He lived for 18. He was a fighter, but 9-11 never left him. 9-11 became him. Uh, he would do it all over again. Eliotto's three daughters have a hard time remembering that dreadful day. Amanda was 10, Ashley was 6, and Alyssa was only 4. Angela Eliotto picked up the two older girls from school earlier than usual that day, but they didn't go home. They went to the neighbor's place. A lot of their neighbors also had family members who were firefighters. All the moms were crying and watching it on TV, so once I started seeing the TV and the, the fire department, I had a feeling, you know, daddy was there. On the morning of 9-11, Thomas Eliotto was heading home after a night shift. After he learned the first plane hit the tower, he turned around and went straight to what had been the World Trade Center. He almost died under the North Tower that was collapsing to the ground. It took him a few hours to free himself from the rubble. And then he just lost track of time. It was a blur, a desperate attempt to find survivors amid the wreckage, the debris, the giant metal beams. He thought he was dead. Um, he, he, I remember him telling me that he had no feeling. He thought something was biting him. I can't just explain it. He was bleeding inside his boots. In 2006, due to health issues, Eliotto had to leave his job. His only outlet now was his family. We lived a little bit different than other children around us. They didn't really understand, you know, our dad came home. That was like, they, your dad came home, that was it. But our dad didn't really come home as who he was. He was a completely different person after that. 
Ashley and Amanda became teachers, like their mother. Eliotto tried to convince Alyssa, the youngest of the three, to do the same, but she chose a career in the police force, and that made him extremely proud. Right before her graduation from the academy, Alyssa and some of her friends went to the National September 11th Memorial and Museum, a tradition New York policemen observe. I sent him a helmet. He said, it's, it's sad. I said, very. He said, look for Mike Esposito, which was his best friend that he lost that day. He had sent me a picture, that exact picture. Um, said, I've been trying to find that. He said, can we spend some time together tonight? I said, yes. And that was December 17th, 2019 at 2 p.m. And what? That was the last time I spoke to him because later that night, lost his battle. Everything in the house still reminds Angela and the girls about Eliodo. I can still like smell the smoke. It makes me feel like my dad's here. It's the second 9-11 anniversary in the house that Eliodo is not present at. A metal cross he found at Ground Zero, awards, his helmets. Eliodo's daughters cherish everything that reminds them of their father. Alyssa's graduation picture has his face photoshopped on it. He died six days before the event, but in the picture, they are together. You can even hear his voice, a little recorder hidden in stuffed toys that still says the words his family heard so many times. For Nina Vishnova in New York, and Rice, VOA News. Following the attacks, the United States launched a war against Al-Qaeda, the terror group who claimed responsibility, and the Taliban who ruled Afghanistan and harbored the terrorist. 20 years later, the Taliban is back in control of Afghanistan. Soldiers from 10th Mountain Division in Fort Drum, New York, were among the first to deploy to Afghanistan in 2001, and they're now among the last to return after the withdrawal. A homecoming nearly 10 months in the making. Troops from the 10th Mountain Division landing on American soil after multiple delays. Turning in their weapons after a historic deployment. It doesn't feel real. Um, I was talking to somebody earlier. You almost feel like somebody's going to call you up and say, okay, yep, just kidding. Uh, we we got to go back. Yeah, we're, we're not done there. Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Chris Rowe said these troops helped turn over every remaining American base in Afghanistan from Helmand in the south to Mazar al-Sharif in the north, and then the military's hub, Bagram Airfield, before finally providing security at Kabul International Airport, helping evacuate more than 120,000 people while under constant threat. Very hectic. Um, rivaled pretty much any deployment that I've been on, uh, quite frankly, and, and you know, <laughs> we've got some good ones, but uh, the uncertainty you speak of, it was very real. Uncertainty from having to rely on the Taliban, America's enemy for two decades and responsible for killing thousands of U.S. troops. Lost guys on patrols, um, you know, multiple rocket attacks at bases that I've been on with soldiers. Uh, it's, it, it wasn't a good feeling. We needed them. At the end of the day, um, they were, you know, that first kind of filter um, and providing us almost like the security outside to allow us to do our jobs. One thing I do know about mountain soldiers, we are mount tough. About half of these soldiers either weren't born or don't remember the terror attacks in 2001 that started the war they ended. <laughs> soldiers of the 10th Mountain Division have felt the impact of the war on terror as much as anyone. 46 deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan since 9-11-2001. Their mission flag now lowered, families sharing that first hug. It felt like home. It felt like exactly where I've been wanting to be for over nine months. It was amazing. For some, 288 days felt like a lifetime. I'm ecstatic. She was five months when he left, so he's missed pretty much all the firsts. A long-awaited reunion for Aubrey and Sam Evans. Their daughter's smile says it all. I feel like I have to be 
a voice for the American citizens that are left behind. That's Nasria. She's one of the 100 to 200 Americans trapped in Afghanistan after the American evacuation efforts ended on August 30th. She asked we only use her first name for her safety. She spoke exclusively to VOA, telling me she's terrified and traumatized. There's been days where, you know, I think to myself, like, am I going to make it home? Am I going to end up living here? Am I going to end up dying here? What's going to happen? 25-year-old California native Nasria came to the Afghan capital in June to visit family and marry her longtime boyfriend. She and her new husband fled to the airport after the Taliban took control, but they never made it in. It was so hard to just get on a flight. There was, there was a couple of days where we had to sleep on streets. People were literally stepping over people. That's how bad it was. After her booked flight home was canceled amid the chaos, she reached out to the State Department for help. They told us, go to a certain location, you will be picked up. And this is from the State Department, you will get picked up, go there. And it was in the middle of the road across the airport. So we went there, waited an extra 12 to 13 hours with no food, no water, nothing. She'd wave her passport. They won't let us go, they're gassing us that they're doing it. But day and night, the Taliban kept blocking her. I was got gun pointed to my head. Our troops were literally at the gate, just waiting for us to continue walking. And they had blocked us. And there was a time where like, I went past them and I started walking as fast as I can. And they started shooting right by my leg and told me to come back or they would shoot me. Oh my God. That's how it was. And I've never in my life have ever been experienced anything like this. It was like a movie scene. It was like coming, it was like literally a movie scene. She says her husband, an Afghan national, even begged the Taliban to let her in the airport without him. But she refused to leave him. I was not going to leave without my husband because I knew in my heart I was never going to, you know, step a foot back in Afghanistan once I go home. And I'm pregnant and definitely my child is going to need a father. I'm going to need a husband by my side. Now that the U.S. military is gone, Nasria says the Taliban are hunting Americans. And apparently they're going door to door from now trying to see, you know, if anybody has a blue passport. The State Department has told her to stay put and they will find a way to get her out but she gets more discouraged with each passing day. I, I don't even think I'm gonna be able to go home. I definitely lost the hope. If I was only 15 steps away from the airport and I was told people are gonna come out of the airport to get me. So what, what hope am I supposed to have now? She certainly is a brave young woman. We are hoping for her safety and that she and Americans and Afghans trapped in Afghanistan can leave soon. Well before the Taliban retook power in Afghanistan, they had been gathering an important resource, money. While it is impossible to know exactly how much money they have amassed, it is clear the militants have been intent on creating financial independence. A June United Nations report estimates the militant group raised $300 million to $1.6 billion annually. Where did the money come from? Much of it came from criminal activity, including opium production and drug trafficking, as well as extortion and kidnapping for ransom. Drug trafficking alone may have earned the Taliban $460 million, according to the report. Other sources of income include taxation in areas they controlled. Daily taxes from a Taliban checkpoint between Pali Kumri and Mazari Sharif alone were estimated to be substantial. The Taliban also ramped up mining operations in areas they controlled, bringing in as much as $464 million last year. Still more money has come from donations by wealthy supporters and a network of non-government charitable foundations. Other sources of funding are foreign governments. U.S. officials have said for years that the Taliban have received money, weapons, and training from Russia. Analysts say the militants also received money from Pakistan and, to a lesser degree, Iran. 
Now that the Taliban are largely in control of Afghanistan, they have the opportunity to raise even more money, including accessing government accounts and through federal taxation. However, they will also incur the costs of running a government. The Afghan government spent $11 billion in 2018. 80% of that came from foreign aid. Some donors have announced they will stop sending aid, at least for now. Economists warn that a scarcity of U.S. dollars could cause the value of the Afghan currency to fall and inflation to rise. The Taliban are also facing a different economy than the one they presided over from 1996 to 2001. The country's GDP has nearly quintupled and the economy has become more urbanized. The 9-11 attacks grounded airline flights in the United States for two days and have forever changed the way people travel by plane. Security screening has come a long way in 20 years. VOA's Julie Tabo shows us how the technology is keeping up. Thomas Carter remembers the horror he felt watching planes crash into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. To watch those events uh, unfold before my eyes, you knew that nothing would ever be the same. Carter is now a federal security director at the Transportation Security Administration, the U.S. federal agency that oversees the nation's airports. He says the mission to make airports safer has in recent years increasingly turned to technology. Technology is a key facet of our counterterrorism mission and it's one of our key tools. That technology, often invisible to the traveler moving through checkpoints, can include scanners that use algorithms to analyze a suspicious item inside a bag, light waves checking liquids for explosives, and coming to an airport near you, biometrics, such as facial recognition technology that can help confirm a person's identity. The AIT, or Advanced Imaging Technology Machine, considered the workhorse of checkpoint security, scans the contours of the body using millimeter wave technology, radio waves passing through clothing, looking for anything unusual, such as explosives or bomb-making equipment. If you were a suicide bomber, you would have to place that device somewhere on your person. This machine allows us to detect that. Some of the latest airport security technology comes from the medical industry. The computed tomography machine works like a magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI machine, giving inspectors a 3D view that can be rotated 360 degrees. Which allows our officers to get an extremely high-definition, high-resolution image. Looking to the future, Carter says there may come a day when travelers scan themselves into the checkpoint with limited touching and mainstream use of biometrics. That includes facial recognition, retina, retina scanning, uh, or fingerprints. The 20th anniversary of 9-11, Carter says, will be a day of remembrance, reflection, and a renewal of purpose, especially as he looks to the Freedom Tower in Manhattan, built where the Twin Towers once stood. We know that that represents uh, the strength of our nation, and we know that we have uh, a mission ahead of us to protect it. Advanced technology and extra patients from passengers worldwide all can help in the mission to keep air travel safe. Julie Tabo, VOA News. Just after the first U.S. troops set foot in Afghanistan, a young reporter working for the American Forces Network went to interview some of the newly deployed troops. That reporter now works for us. VOA's Kane Fairball recently visited some of the troops he met 20 years ago for their perspectives on the service they performed and the impact it had. My assignment to Afghanistan in 2002 was to understand the conditions and motivations of service members who were spending their first 4th of July holiday after 9-11 in Afghanistan trying to route the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. Meanwhile, an Air Force B-52 was also in the area on a planned mission to bomb suspected Taliban and Al-Qaeda locations. My friend and American Forces Network colleague, Staff Sergeant Dan Milbauer, accompanied me on our first experience in a combat zone. When you come into the country the way we did in a military aircraft and under cover of darkness um, to avoid being shot at and landing in a corkscrew, um, kind of pattern, you know, that, that's kind of when it first hits you that, oh yeah, this, <laughs> this is real. Um, you know, we, we are going into harm's way. At the time, nearly 10,000 U.S. forces were in harm's way. 
many based at Bagram Airfield, which was quickly growing into one of the largest U.S. military facilities in the world. It's where Rhonda Lawson served with a U.S. Army Mobile Public Affairs Detachment, or MPAD, which hosted us in Afghanistan. I'm a print journalist by trade. To keep U.S. troops there informed, her team produced a base newspaper and other products. We run stories not just here at Bagram, but also stories from Kabul. Every once in a while we might get a story from Kandahar or from um, Uzbekistan. What I took pride in doing was telling the soldier's story. We talked about the mission, but at the same time, I wanted people to know that our soldiers were real people. Our soldiers had families. Our soldiers had feelings. U.S. troops also received messages from back home showing passionate support for their mission. One of the um, cards that I got, it just said, kick bin Laden's ass on it. You know, so there was some that sense that we needed to get revenge. But finding bin Laden took nearly a decade. Neither Lawson nor others we spoke to during our 2002 visit. It's like a long ass camping trip. Thought operations in Afghanistan would become the longest in U.S. history. There's a storm. A lot of the um, fighting ended in about six weeks. So I think people thought that this was going to be quick, like there's a storm. Of course, obviously, a lot of us thought that uh, any operations around 9-11 response would be temporary or quick. As the war in Afghanistan dragged on, Milbauer returned to the country a second time in 2003 to work with a psychological operations or PSYOP unit. It's really kind of trying to, I guess, st strategically put out information. Milbauer says he noticed some things had changed when he returned to Bagram Airfield. There was more activity, more people there, and then I think more coalition partners had forces there. And working in Afghanistan was more dangerous, says Milbauer. He vividly remembers a close call during a mission to support a remote Afghan radio station. I heard this whistling of an RPG coming in, uh, so it passed over my head. No one was injured, says Milbauer. For him, the constant threat of attack didn't change his outlook on U.S. military objectives, including helping locals to have a better life. Some of the things we did, when I say we, I mean the coalition forces, was to you know, teach people that kind of stuff and provide them with clean water sources and um, you know, lots of money to, to improve their, their lives. So in that regard, I was, you know, I was behind that all the way. Milbauer and Lawson were two of more than 775,000 U.S. forces who served at least one deployment to Afghanistan since 2001. More than 2,300 lost their lives. Despite the country now falling back into the hands of the Taliban, Lawson, who retired from the U.S. Army in 2017, believes the U.S. effort was not in vain. I will never consider our presence in Afghanistan a failure. I, you know, it's hard to say whether the mission was accomplished in total. Milbauer, who left the military in 2007, feels the U.S. reached the point of doing all it could in Afghanistan. We've found and eliminated Osama bin Laden. You know, I think after 20 years, it's probably time to get out of there and let them try to take care of themselves the best they can. Many Afghans are now worried about how they will be treated by the Taliban, who took control of most of the country as U.S. forces pulled out of Afghanistan, ending America's longest conflict. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Peterborough, New Hampshire. That's all for now on this episode of The Inside Story. For the latest news, go to voanews.com or follow me on Twitter at Carla Babb VOA. I'm Carla Babb at the Pentagon. See you next week on The Inside Story. Thank you.